Welcome everybody to the Periodic Table of History. This is where we study history in four dimensions. So we have our time dimension right here and we just hop into our time machine where we can explore geography. So here's our 6,000 years of history from Adam all the way to the current present day. And you may be over here in the United States and you might be over here in the United Kingdom. But wherever you are from, what we're going to talk about today is when were the prophets? So the prophets were a topic that I always wanted to get to, finally got to, and I was intrigued with the results. So what we're going to be talking about are prophets, and that primarily happens from about 1000 BC to a little after 1 AD. And remember, Europe is over here on the left, Middle East, Asia over here, North America on the right. And then if you're interested in Africa, we have that on another graph. It just wouldn't fit on the top graph. And so the awesome African continent over here, amazingly how the history unfolds in it. But as far as Africa, Egypt is the big player where the Bible is concerned because of the proximity of Israel and Judea to Egypt so here's the big picture map. It's, it's instructive to actually know where these countries and people groups are. So the big picture is like this. Egypt, a major player. Chaldea, Assyria, Medes, Persians, and then these others that are close to Israel. Israel being in the north and Judea being in the south. And so you can see, if you've heard of the Bible stories about the Philistines attacking, well, the Philistines um, had the coast and could always get reinforcements and get technologies from other, other countries in the Mediterranean. So, so the Philistines uh, were right there next to Judea, Moab, and Edom right next to them also. And then Israel had some other players that were always getting close to them, and that was the the Ammonites, the Aramites, the Phoenicians, and also Moab borders a little bit on Israel as well. But getting a picture of this and having some idea in our mind of the geography is really quite helpful. Now we'll go back up. And so we are going to be looking at Israel right in this region. So let's zoom up in here. And you have to forgive me for having to zoom in and out. For us to get the detail, we have to zoom up like this. But in order to get the big picture, we have to zoom out a little bit. In order to get the big picture so we can come down here. And how I've got this set up is Israel's here in the blue with Solomon. And Solomon dies. The kingdom breaks up into the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And just like we see here on the map here, northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, right there. So the color scheme is Israel has this turquoise and Judah has this sort of gray lavender. And we can see, if I zoom up, Jeroboam 1 and Rehoboam. As far as the numbers, uh, these are Thiel's dates, Edwin Thiel, and he got them to about one year. So you can see there's a slash here. It means that Jeroboam I started his reign either 931 or 930 BC until 910 or 909 BC. And if you just add up the Masoretic dates, then you get some number that's close to this as far as 3,185 or something from the beginning of time. So no matter how you count, um, you're going to get some varying degrees as to what absolute time is from the beginning uh, based on whether you use Josephus, who supposedly used the Nehemiah scrolls, the Samaritan Pentateuch, or the Septuagint, or whatever. Uh, based upon whatever you do, you're going to come up with different numbers here. But the dates here about the kings with Edwin Thiel, they're pretty accurate within about one year. 
And so the, you'll see some dates that'll say 931 to 910, and other dates that you go to a different encyclopedia or something, it'll say 930 to 909. And uh, that's just part of the game, I suppose. I've gotten over it a long time ago. So like I said before, just forgive me for having to zoom out and zoom in, but you can see if we are going, if we're going down through time, then there's these turquoise boxes for Israel, and there are these gray lavender boxes that are for Judah. And the recent thing that I did was put these green boxes in, okay, and these green boxes represent the different prophets, uh, what this video is about. So we can get into the first few, and those would be Elijah, Elisha, Micaiah, and then Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah prophesied against the Edomites, see? So we have to know who are the Edomites. Well, the, this group of people that's right here. And the Edomites came from Esau, who was the brother of Jacob, Jacob and Esau. So here you have Jacob, Judah, and Esau, Edom. When you start getting all this stuff figured out, it, it's quite fascinating. But you can see here that, that here's Obadiah. Now, a lot of times we don't necessarily have when they were born, when they died, but there is usually some information in the text where the particular prophet might say, when the Edomites rebelled, or, or something like that. When the, when the Edomites rebelled against Jehoram. And so then we know that we can get this close to at least the reign of Jehoram. If we go over here to the left, uh, we can see these other prophets, Elijah, Elisha, that we hear a lot about, and you can read about them in First and Second Kings. Also, Micaiah. So these four prophets are right here around Ahab, Ahaziah, and then also Jehoram. We get a diverse amount of miracles that various people performed and so on and so forth, especially Elijah and Elisha. Remember, Elisha over here got a double portion of the anointing of Elijah. Um, but, but that does the setup for, for what we're getting into, and this is kind of a big picture view of the prophets. Going forward just a little bit, remember Joel. Joel gives us the prophecy that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So he was prophesying at the time of Jehoash, or Joash. It is spelled different ways. Now, Jonah, yeah, he is talked about quite a bit in the Bible stories, uh, especially in Sunday school. Jonah, the one that was swallowed by the huge fish. So, against Nineveh. Well, who, who is Nineveh? We've got to go to our, our map once again. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And it's about where Baghdad is currently. But when in your mind you can marry the geography with the people with the time, and then you put the story in that, you can understand what's going on. And you can understand things a lot better even today. Events that are happening today are just continuations of events that have always happened throughout the span of time. So Jonah was against Nineveh, uh, didn't want to prophesy against them, but due to his prophecy, Nineveh repented. And I'm going to zoom out here a little bit so we can get a grasp of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire is, is over here. I'll, I'll kind of click near it. Maybe I can get an arrow out. Yeah, I can. Assyria is kind of in the peach color over here. So, so Jonah's prophesying around here. Nineveh of Assyria repents, and you see they bide themselves a little bit of time. They get an extra, more than a century extra time because they repented back here. And if you recall, Jesus was always talking about this wicked and adulterous generation. Well, if the wicked and adulterous generation continues, it is destroyed. If it repents, then its time is extended. And that is one of the beliefs I have, especially with the commandment that says, Honor your father and mother, and I will, 
and long life will I give to you. So anyway, right here you have the Assyrians, you have the Chaldeans, which Babylon is, an, is the major city of. The Empire of the Medes is here, and the Elamitic Empire is here from Elam. And that turns into the, the Medo-Persian, the, the Medo-Elamite Empire turns into the Persian Empire over here. So a lot of what we hear about as far as the prophecies here in the Old Testament uh, are concerning Israel, Egypt, Assyria, Chaldea, and eh, I could say Persia. I'll just say Persia because that's the, the name that we're familiar with over here. But I've always found that interesting that Jonah prophesied against Nineveh, and much to his dismay in the book, Nineveh repented and he was unhappy. <laughs> Kind of funny. It, it goes to show the type of mentality. I've always laughed at this mentality. It is a mentality that thinks one group is better than another group. And Jonah had a really rough time with that. Well, let's move on just a little bit. If we, you know, we can go over here to the left now. Here's another green box. It's going to be Hosea. Uh, he has quite a dramatic prophetic charge. He is supposed to marry a prostitute to dramatize the relationship between God and Israel. That God is constantly asking Israel to repent, repent, repent as his wife. And his wife is constantly going after other gods and will not repent. And so Hosea is to marry the prostitute, which he does. And then the prostitute's always running off and sleeping with men, men on the street. And so that is the dramatization. Very, very interesting, very uh, graphic, I would say, as far as the way God is thinking about this equation. Um, and this is during the time of Jehoash and Jeroboam too. A lot of times the way the uh, Israeli and Judean kings did as they had an overlapping reign. Um, and so these time boxes are drawn side by side so you can so you can know here that that uh, there was a co-regency between Jeroboam II and Jehoash and as Jehoash is going out Jeroboam II is learning then Jeroboam II uh, keeps on going. So you see that quite a bit in in this uh, scenario in this matrix. So going down a little bit more, Amos. Amos. Oh, here's here's a fun one. Uh, two years before the earthquake. If you if you look in Amos chapter 1 verse 1, uh, it time stamps when Amos was prophesying. And then, you know, it goes on and says, okay, this is during the reign of Jeroboam 2. But we get these other pieces of information. And when I was studying Bede of England, Nenius, uh, people like that in the, in the United Kingdom, British uh, history, English-speaking history, um, you see things like that. That uh, uh, When you're reading these old texts, you will come across things like uh, uh, there was a lunar eclipse, or there was a comet that went by, and everybody was talking about the comet that went by. And those are really fun markers as far as astronomy. And when you get into cosmology, then you can sometimes trace these events back uh, and, and pinpoint them based upon what our mathematical models say about when comets are spinning around our, our planets and visible to, to Earth. And things like this, the earthquake, um, studies have been done to show this did indeed happen. This earthquake did indeed happen, and that is thought to be maybe around 760 B.C. But, you know, there we go. Just these nuggets of information that just make uh, the scriptures come alive as far as real people on this earth with real events happening. Sometimes we relegate these people into maybe like cavemen or something like that. And, and that caveman idea is just that ugh, evolutionary idea, which I hate. 
and it purports that the people in times past were really stupid. When you get into the atheistic perspective, it's like anything in history is stupid. We are given this prejudice through our education system, which is a shame. On with the other prophets from Amos, but just a note that's kind of fun is that Amos there has uh, talked about an earthquake being there. And notice when we zoom out, see, you, you can't really read them when I zoom out like this. If you think to yourself about the shape, see, here's the northern kingdom going down and the southern kingdom going down. These people start crying out and warning against the people to be wicked. And you can see these green boxes just becoming interspersed. Here, 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 down here, there's always some prophet that's saying, hey guys, repent, repent, repent. You can do better than living in the sewer and just being a sewer mind person. You can do better than that. There's always somebody there warning everybody. Repent, repent, repent. And and uh, so you can see the shape is just continuous. It kind of is, it's a little bit like an S curve in here. But if you graphed them all together, you would see that it was continuous or maybe nearly continuous uh, when the prophets actually lived and their impact at any given time. So we talked about Amos. Now we're down here with, uh, well, I guess, Jotham. Um, Ahaz. We hear a little bit more about Ahaz. Ah, Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the major prophets. And as far as the years go, that's somewhere around 750 BC. And he prophesied during multiple kings' reign. So we can see Ahaz here and Hezekiah. Uh, and if we go to the Israel north side, well, over in, in Israel's time, we see, oh, not going too well. These uh, You can see that um, division is sown. When people are wicked, they don't care about their neighbors. They don't care about the people in their kingdom. So everybody is just getting their nose broken all over the place. And so we see Zechariah King not living very long. Six-month reign. And then we have Shalom, a one-month reign. I mean, this is things are not going well when you see this scheme of time graphed out like this. And when you see these little slivers of reigns, that means people are getting chopped down. Um, so Menahem and then Pekah and Hoshea. Uh, now that was that marked the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. So, so you can see that these prophets are just saying, repent, repent, repent. Stop with your human sacrifice abortions. Stop with your homosexuality. Israel would not repent, and so the prophets uh, said, "No, this is the decree. You're gone." And and there were, you know, again, we'll we'll go over here to here's Israel. Here's the end of Israel, and here is Assyria. Look at that. Now the Assyrians were mean, mean, mean people. We we think about people being mean today. Somebody got bullied because somebody called somebody a name and stuff like that. Well, the Assyrians, they were mean people. They would peel your skin and pull your fingernails out of your fingers. You know, these were mean guys. And they just thought that was the way to do things. And so there were uh, 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 educated people and religious people that say, hey, you know, how, why would you bring the Assyrians. Why, why, God, would you bring the Assyrians over here against Israel when the Assyrians are worse than Israel? And God said, hey, I'm going to judge them too. <laughs> they better not be wicked either. Remember, they came off from their wickedness, but they're still a rugged bunch of people. And then later they, you know, so there was uh, Jonah prophesying against them. And then later Assyria comes in, knocks out Israel, the northern kingdom over here, And then God says, I'm going to judge them as well. So they were judged and their, their time ended. And let's zoom out. Because uh, when we're talking about Assyria, they lasted. Look at, look at this. They were from after the flood all the way down into the maybe 600s or, or something. We, we'll zoom in there and get the actual date. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, 612. Uh, Me fell to the Medes and Babylonians. Okay, so... 
so that was 612. But look at this. They lasted all the way from the flood. You know, and, and they are somewhat... Are they on the uh, Sumerian kings list? I'm not... I'm pretty sure some of these kings are on the Sumerian kings list. And that king list talk about the, the flood and then the kings and these different these different kingdoms that are around after the flood. So we're we're talking about um, the Assyrians being a powerful kingdom all the way until almost 600 BC, almost 600 BC. See, but that's again we're just we're talking about Israel ending right here and Assyria ending right here. Um, so back to that. So the prophet said, "Please, please, please repent," and they would not repent. Uh, uh, that makes our graphing a lot more simple because uh, now we now we can come in here. See, there's Assyria. Um, they came in this way and just went pop, 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 and got Israel. The Assyrians pulled the people out of Israel and 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 put them all over. Uh, wherever they could find a place to put them. Okay, but then there are still refugees that are just hanging out here in Israel. But now the, the focus shifts over here to Judah. And here we are with Judah. Judah is left, and, and now we have uh, the prophet Micah. See, so there's Jotham. There's Ahaz about... 735 down to about 716 or 715 BC. And then Hezekiah down here, 716 to maybe 687 or 686 BC. So Isaiah, so Isaiah and Micah, they are, they are done with their prophesying. We have this new scheme where Judah is now very much on its own. Instead of having would-be pretend allies of your brothers in the north, now those are deposed, and now you have uh, Judah all on its own. And there are different snippets throughout Scripture, through, through Kings, through Chronicles, and through the prophets that say, uh, repent, repent, repent. And then there are certain kings that try to be relatively good in Judah and some that are still evil. And so uh, they are um, a mixed bag. They get a little extra time, just like Assyria, just like the Gentile country of Assyria got a ex little extra time. And you can, you can see that extra time here. Uh, Northern Kingdom ends. Judah gets this extra bit of time to keep on going. And the next prophet is Nahum. Nahum. Um, so he predicts the fall of Assyria before Assyria falls. But this is during the reign of Esaradan and Ashurbanipal, and then the king Manasseh in Judea. He has a relatively long reign. Here's a few more kings, and we have Zephaniah. He prophesied from about 635 to 625 B.C. And it gets really interesting up here in Ezekiel because this is when the inflection point of Israel is starting to come to a head. And that is, we have Ezekiel, Habakkuk in 612 B.C. prophesying, and Jeremiah. And Jeremiah actually lives to see the fall of Jerusalem. You know, they, they don't kill him. They, they throw him in a, a well at one time. Um, he's stuck down in the muck uh, looking up, and the king saying, "Well, we'll see if you're a real prophet or not." But uh, you know that that kind of a test is a very uh, slippery slope. You see, if Jeremiah is correct, and Babylon is going to come and clean your clock, that means you're destroyed. <laughs> so they can see that Jeremiah is a true prophet if if uh, Babylon actually comes. And so that's a very difficult place to be if you're a king. He is called the weeping prophet because he also writes lamentations and he weeps for Jerusalem because of the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, Je Jehoiakim, he ends up becoming a puppet, puppet king to Necho, 
or Nicho, I'm not actually sure how to say it, but Jehoiakim comes to reign in about 609 BC, reigns until 598 BC, but, but he has some pretty intense problems to deal with. He becomes a puppet king in 608 BC. That's a good date to remember. So that's the start of Israel becoming subservient, completely subservient. Even the king is subservient to foreign powers. So I'm going to zoom out here in the, the big picture because it's a Necho II. I think it was Necho II in Egypt that um, did that. Yeah, okay, here he is. Is that right? Yeah. Or Nicho. You can write down how it's really supposed to be pronounced in the comment section if you so choose. And this is the 26th dynasty of Egypt. You can see the pharaohs here. I'll go down, 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 down. Going back to our, our maps then here. Egypt, very close proximity to Judah, and Judah gets hit from the Egyptian side. And then Judah gets hit from the Chaldean, Babylonian side. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Uh, Assyria and Babylonia believed in a very stringent form of punishment for anyone who didn't pay taxes to them. And they thought they were the coolest thing that ever happened in the world, even though there are some pretty intense large empires being developed uh, in the background at this time, and those are Axum, uh, China, India, uh, Greece. They're starting to become pretty big players on the world stage. But Assyria is geographically, it thinks, that, hey, we, we've got everything under control. And Assyria did not have everything under the control. Yeah, let's go to them just for a second. Um, because when we go back to Assyria, we see, see they're falling apart. Syrian kingdom is falling apart. Now the Chaldean kingdom is coming up. And so you can see these, um, let's see here's Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we say Nebuchadnezzar. In the Chaldean, it's Nabuchadnezzar II. That's Nebuchadnezzar, 605 to 562 BC. Uh, and, and you see I have um, Daniel. Daniel is taken to Babylon of Chaldee. So that happened in 604 BC. So Egypt weakened Judah substantially, and they were from coming in from the west. Yeah, Egypt, Egypt hurt them substantially, and then Chaldee, which had taken over Syria and bumped Assyria completely out of the equation now. Now Chaldee is hitting Judah from the east. So things are really bad for Israel. But the prophecies have to keep on being fulfilled. And the prophecy from the beginning is that the seed of the woman would crush the devil's head. So we have Israel still being used by God here to, to, uh, to get down to where Jesus is. So right here, did we, did we get these? We got Jeremiah. Okay, here's the info on Jeremiah, the different dates. Um, and we have Habakkuk, we have Ezekiel. And, we, and Ezekiel was a pretty big player. I mean, he is a, a, called a, a major prophet. So major prophets are Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. Those are the four major prophets. So, and you can see three of them right here. Yeah, so, so you can see um, Daniel over here on the Jewish side, but then he gets transposed, and, and you see Nebuchadnezzar right here. So now this is very intriguing, too, because when we, when we go into here, we can see the, the Median kingdom uh, creeping up. When we get down here to Nebuchadnezzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar will have known Syaxeres right here of the Medes. Um, and I, I find these connections to be 
just uh, baffling and mind-boggling. You know, there are so many. I wish I could say so much, but you know, we have to we have to just keep on going. But uh, 604 taken to Babylon, Belsh Belshazzar co-regent. So this is a, a bit of confusion here. And then 539 is the writing on the wall with, with Daniel. Let's go into that just a little bit because Nebuchadnezzar is, is, um, is up here. And then we have these other kings that are reigning. And, and then in that same time, see, we have Nabonidus, Nabonidus. Um, this is a problem because um, he was he was away on campaigns, and then a uh, what is thought to be a, a relative of Nebuchadnezzar is Belshazzar that was here in the decision making throne room of the Chaldeans, and he was really just a, a party playboy, and and uh, didn't do too well. Remember, he took the uh, gold things from the temple, and he decided that he would use the temple artifacts that they had taken or had been taken from the Jewish temple, and he would use them to sacrifice to the gods of gold and and wine over in Babylon. Those were the gods he he really really thought a lot of, and Marduk, right? You know that was you know one of their their gods, but when you read in Daniel. Belshazzar praises the gods of gold and wine, and then there's the writing on the wall. So that's happening over here in Chaldee, which has encompassed Assyria. But by weakening Assyria, a um, power vacuum is, is created. And so what happens now? We've got the Medes and the Persians, right? See, right on the other side of this mountain range, there's the Medes. You know, they thought they were big stuff here in Assyria and Chaldea, but they didn't realize that their population is getting bigger the same as the Medes' population are getting bigger. And remember, we have talked about the Silk Road before, that when we go to the bigger scheme of things, there is a Silk Road that comes over here from Tarsus, over here in the Mediterranean. It goes across, you know, it one, in one way, it goes across a, a path of least resistance over here into Xi'an, China. And then in another way, goes over here into India. India and China are trading partners. And then there's a piratey ship, bustling piratey ship business of trade happening down here between the kingdom of Aksum in Africa and and India over here and sometimes would get over here into Sina or China. Um, so there's there there are these trade routes that have been forming. So Assyria and Chaldea, they're in the middle of the world. They think they're better than everybody, but at the same time the technologies of these other kingdoms are improving despite Assyria. So when Assyria finally gets crushed, now the weight of the all these other kingdoms are now with the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And then the Medes and the Persians get together and claim the clock of, of Chaldea. So so they they didn't know what was, was there left of them. And, and you know, I, I've got to say something about this. I've made some other videos about when Shem uh, lived. And so let's just look at this a little bit. If we turn the descendants of Shem on, I've got videos of, of the descendants of Shem. The, the originals are right here. See, Elam is the father of the Elamites. And we have Aram over here, the fifth son of Shem. And look at this, we still have Aram right here. So even though the Shemites set up here on this Tigris and Euphrates, the Tigris and Euphrates River right here, you can see the five sons of Shem there. Elam, Asher, father of the Assyrians. Arphaxad, said, father of the Chaldeans. Lud of the Lydians that you've heard because now we're getting over here into Western culture. And we, you know, if you're into music or any type of art or humanities, you've heard of the Lydians. Well, they're... Lud is the father of the Lydians. See, nothing has changed. This is the incredible thing about this. And I might you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn Japheth on also. Let's turn him on. Okay. 
Maide is the father of the Medes. So do you see this? Nothing has changed. You just have population centers getting bigger and bigger, and they're impressing upon others. And you have kingdoms are fighting. Kingdoms are fighting each other directly, like Assyria and Chaldea, but they have no idea that on the big scale of things, there are there are big things happening. Other cultures are getting a lot bigger. And we can have the Hamites also. See, and the Hamites are setting up here uh, around around Egypt, and they're all pressing in on each other. But I've also I've 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 just so found that interesting because of this, this effect of cultures getting together and dominating and thinking they're going to take over another culture, but they never really do. Because right now, see, we still have Iraq here and we still have Iran. Well, Iran are the Medo-Persians and Iraq are the Assyria Chaldeans. So it doesn't really change. They can try to get their country together. They can try to conquer, but it doesn't ever really work. And so, so we are here with, with Daniel. And then we see the Elam dynasty. Why is it an Elam dynasty? Because they're from Elam, the first son of Shem. <laughs> Incredible. Okay. <laughs> Persians, see, they changed it to the Persians. They become the Medo- Persians, and uh, they, they start en enlisting the help of the Medes. Remember the first part of the message of the writing of the wall, Midi Midi. Yeah. So let's go down, 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 down. Now Ezra was a scribe. He was doing his history, and he saw that there was a proclamation by Cyrus the Great encouraging the Jews to return from Babylon to Judea. He wanted a buffer state between himself and Egypt. So, so this was a wise ruler, and he did not try to just wipe uh, other kingdoms out. So when the Medes and the Persians got together, instead of being extraordinarily ruthless like the Assyrians and the Chaldeans, they decided to try to make happy groups of people by giving them autonomy. So when the Persians came in here, actually, uh, Daniel, the prophet, gave Cyrus, see, here's, let me zoom out. <laughs> here's, here's where the Chaldeans are. Here's where Daniel is. Daniel fits through all of this stuff. He knows these Chaldean kings. He knows these Median kings. And he knows these Persian kings. So Daniel is looking in Jeremiah and gives a prophecy to Cyrus, hands him the Cyrus, and Cyrus, and, and it calls Cyrus by name. So the Persians have this modus operandi to let the people worship their own gods and things like that, and he does. So Ezra comes on the scene a little later, but he's looking back in history, and he recollects this proclamation by Cyrus. So when you're reading the prophets, you're actually reading uh, notes that kings are sending back and forth to each other. I mean, that is intense. So we're going to zoom back up here into Israel. Remember, the kings are gone now. There's Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the puppet king. Um, Jehoiakim, puppet king of Egypt. Zedekiah, puppet king of Babylon, uh, decides to do this really weird thing and not, and not pay taxes to... Babylon, and it's kind of like a mouse telling a lion that the lion better not want any taxes. And Nebuchadnezzar does not take that well, comes and cleans his clock. Daniel, like what we talked about. And now when we get down to Ezra, we're coming down to 538. See, remember, uh, we had subservient kings of Judah in 608. So now we come 70 years down and we come to 538. Proclamation encouraging Jews to return. We have Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai was an older prophet and Zechariah was a younger prophet. So they're both prophesying about the restoration of the temple. 
And this is so as the Jews come back to Israel, uh, they can restore this temple. But the prophecies are saying, hey, you guys are goofing around and stuff, and you're trying to fix your house and everything. Uh, well, what we need to do is fix the, the temple. Uh, so, so the people get together. They decide, okay, yeah, we're really going to do this. 516, the temple is restored. After the temple was finished, they needed to finish the wall because they kept on getting raided. So you can hear about the raids here. And Nehemiah has an a awesome sense of governorship, and he does finish the wall. I mean, he's sent there in 445, and the, the wall is finished in 444. I mean, he whips them into shape. So if you want a guy that wants to get things done, Nehemiah is the guy. And he does such a good job, he becomes the governor of Jerusalem. And then he, he returns. He and Artaxerxes are friends, and Artaxerxes sends him back. So, so we see the end of the prophets here in 425. I mean, amazing, amazing. We'll just go over here. Just we have Esther on the scene. She's not a prophet, but she just happens to pop up here under Xerxes, and then. Nehemiah here. See, he's sent to Jerusalem from this area because he's friends with Artaxerxes, uh, last of them being Nehemiah. I know Malachi is the last book, but Malachi is, is actually in time just a little bit before this. Um, and, and so maybe that fills in a lot of questions into your mind about, about what's going on during this time. So I'm zooming out to see the big picture once again, the big picture of history. And, and you can see we went through just about King Solomon, the breakup, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, and then the prophets started prophesying against everyone that was doing wickedness in that area. Um, Northern Kingdom ends because of Assyria. So the Southern Kingdom ends because of Egypt and Chaldea, Babylon. Then you have the exiles in Babylon and Persia, and then you have the return. The end of those Old Testament prophets, kings started and then the prophets had to start warning them after the fact. Well, then the kings are destroyed and the prophets take on the line of history after the kings. And a little bit later, we have rule by Babylon. And remember, we're, now we're getting into the 300s BC. And so we can think of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, then the Ptolemies, that are those areas around Greece, and then Rome. And if you want to study this area, you have to go to the, the Apocrypha. Yeah, so we have the, the prophets ending right here. That was under Persian rule. Babylon first, and Persia. Then we have Alexander the Great, remember? Uh, Josephus has some interesting things to say about that, that Alexander the Great actually went into Jerusalem, and the prophets in Jerusalem prophesied for, on behalf that Alexander the Great would have victory. And so Alexander the Great did not destroy Jerusalem. He, he got what he wanted to hear, I guess. And he went on doing great victories all, all into India. So that was uh, Alexander the Great. He, he didn't uh, last very long, but then the Ptolemies. So then we have the rule of the Ptolemaics, and then Rome comes on the scene. Well, we have the Maccabean revolt in here that sets up the Hasmonean priestly line, and then we get into the Herods down here, the dynasty of Herods when Jesus comes on the scene. I don't know about you, but when I look at the history of the world from the biblical perspective, it is downright awesome. You have the Assyrian kingdoms being prophesied of hundreds of years before events happen in Assyria. You have uh, God actually using his prophets hundreds of years before to give a message to Cyrus of Persia. You have all of this coming together with the temple being rebuilt, the walls being rebuilt, Herod's down here rebuilding part of the temple, Jesus comes on the scene. And you remember, Jesus comes on the scene, that second temple with that uh, market area that Herod built, and he drives those people out of the temple saying, this is not going to be the house of merchandise, this is going to be the house of prayer. See, coming on the scene down here, Jesus' life, just 
staggering how how this all works out. And one last prophet I wanted to, to talk about was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist comes on the scene and he would have known Antipas and Philip. He would probably have known Agrippa, as Agrippa would have been younger. He would have known Pontius Pilate, and he would have known Caiaphas, maybe even Eliezer ben Ananus. But Jesus and John the Baptist would have known these political figures from the area. And Jesus talks about John the Baptist, and he says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, Matthew eleven thirteen. So God was there right from the beginning, right from Adam, saying, the seed of the woman, singular, that's the Messiah that's going to come later, is going to crush the head of the serpent. And on down to Abraham acting out prophecy in his lifetime. Then you have the time of the kings and the prophets, and God using his prophets to keep everything together because he was going to make sure the time was right for the chosen seed to come on this earth, Jesus Christ. And then the scripture says they didn't know the time of their visitation. So even with John the Baptist warning the people and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is here, people did not repent. Jesus came on the scene, was crucified, and then in 70 A.D., Vespasian and Titus came in and made sure one stone was not left upon another in the temple as they destroyed that temple. I am just in awe of the scriptures at times, and when I study the prophets, it is one of those times that God, outside of time, prophesied through all these eras of time about Jesus, and there are still prophecies that are unfolding before our eyes in our present day. And as Solomon said, wow, there's nothing new under the sun that we can shock God with. So hopefully you can think about your life and think about where you can get better, where you can be awesome, and have the shackles that so easily entangle us destroyed. And that's my prayer for you, and that's my prayer for America and the world. Like Even though we see a lot of crazy things happening in our world, just one step away, all we have to do is repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. Repent and stop doing stupid things ourselves, and forgive other people when they do stupid things. And this world will be a hundred times better than we can ever imagine. And the sooner we do that, the better that will happen for us and for the world. So thanks for watching. So remember, it's always free to subscribe, share, and comment. And if you do comment, try to write something down that will help somebody else. Thanks. Have a great day and have a great week. I'll see you next time.